Hallelujah. We're not able to hear the lectures in one place, but at your respective homes, as you pay attention to the lecture, I believe that God will pour down His great grace upon you guys. Today, I'd like to share grace based on the book, uh, History of Redemption series, book number two. The title is The Genealogy of the Living Numbered in the Wilderness. What does it mean to be numbered? And what is the who can enter this genealogy of the living that um, God is pleased with? The Israelites, all of their journey until they entered Canaan, it shows the whole history of redemption of the saints on our journey to heaven. But the Israelites, they all came out of Egypt putting their lives on the line to go into Canaan, but not all of them were able to enter. What they had to go through was the wilderness. In the wilderness, they were divided into life and death. And the wilderness represents the church life today. So today we must pay attention to what happened in the wilderness. Then who are those that survived the wilderness until the end? They are the ones who overcame all the trials, temptations, and tribulations. God was pleased with them, and he numbered them. And this is the genealogy of the living. We're going to main, num main point number one. The census of the living in the wilderness. The census, the people were numbered in the wilderness. This event is really important, redemptive historically. One of the books in the Bible that talks about the uh, wilderness is the book of Numbers. And it means to count the number of people. The Numbers, the Book of Numbers, is the book that records the number of people in the wilderness. In Hebrew, the, number, the name Numbers is Be Midbar, and it means in, in the wilderness. And in the Septuagint, it was translated as Arithmoi in Greek, which also means Numbers. So the numbers that were seen in the wilderness the key point of the book of Numbers is the two census of soldiers. Just as God commanded, they numbered the people and it's recorded in, very, in much detail in the book of Numbers. The first census was recorded in Numbers chapter 1, verse 46, 603,550. And then in chapter 26, it talks about the second census. And it says they were 601,730. It was not an approximate number, but it's very precise in the number. What does it mean to number something or someone? What do you count? Do you count the number of socks in your house? To count something means that it's valuable and there is significance. And it's even more so in redemptive history. When there are numbers recorded in redemptive history, that is acknowledged by God. And that is usually when God records those that he acknowledges. And in them are God's expectations and the missions that God has for them. And so God counts. And especially in the wilderness, God counted those who would go into Canaan alive. Then this happened in the past, but why is it important? That is because in the wilderness, God continued to count the people, and those who passed, God remembered them. And God will count in the end times as well. God will count those who are to enter heaven. He is counting their numbers. Psalm chapter 87 verse 6 says, The Lord will count when he registers the people. This one was born there. Those who have been saved, in order for them to be registered in heaven, God counts each and every single one of them. 
As female evangelists, one of the things that we have to do during worship service is to report the number of people who have given worship service, and we count the saints. And when we count, we think, oh, that person came too. Oh, that person came to the summer conference. And they just look so precious to us. And probably God also sees them and regards them as very precious, and I believe that God is counting us during worship service as well. And if there is a genealogy for those, the living ones who are to enter heaven, uh, the book of Revelation calls it the book of life. There are those who are to be recorded in the book of life, and it says that they are the ones who overcome. Then those who are to enter heaven, who are the ones that will be recorded in the book of life? Through the census, we can say that God is uh, foreshadowing and foretelling of those um, people to be recorded in the genealogy. And second, the census of soldiers is like the genealogy of the living. The living ones, their genealogy, it is like this geneal genealogy. Usually in genealogies, you think of um, one where names are recorded. But all of those names, God compressed them into numbers. And that's how we can look at the censuses. So the first census, it says all the congregation, all the congregation, God counted them as representatives. And it says, by their families, by their father's households, they were counted. And this is not just a simple total number, but it also records which tribe they're from. And especially in Numbers chapter 1, verse 18, it says, they registered by ancestry. And this word, ancestry, you all know the word Toledo, the word for genealogy. The root word for that word is Yalad, and this is what it uses for ancestry. And this means that the census of the soldiers uh, represents the form of the genealogy. The second census, it says, take a census of all the congregation by their father's households. And this is not just a total number, but it also records the tribe that they're from. And also they counted, and then it says the land was distributed according to the numbers the number of names, and each shall be given their inheritance according to those who are numbered of them. According to the names of the tribes of their fathers, they received the land, the inheritance. The land was given according to the tribe. Then just as we saw in the first and sen second censuses, those who have the mission to fight once they enter Canaan and those who will receive the land as an inheritance, God acknowledged them as the covenant of people and acknowledged them to be part of the genealogy of the living. Then you and I must enter this numbering of the living ones. They are the ones who pass some kind of test then in order to see what kind of test they went through, we need to take a look at the background of the census. Big point number two, the background of the first census at the beginning of the wilderness journey. This first census, we took a look at it, but it is recorded in Numbers chapter 1. And the date and location is 1445 B.C. on the first day of the second month, right before departing from the wilderness of Sinai. This important event of the census, the date and location is important, and that is why Numbers chapter 1 verse 1 records where and when it happened. Then this wilderness of Sinai, what kind of place was it? The Israelites, the year of Exodus, on the first day of the third month, they arrived at the wilderness of Sinai and stayed there all the way until the following year on the 20th day of the second month. 
and then they went on to the next stage. But on the first day of the second month, right before departing from the wilderness of Sinai, the census was taken. And what does this mean? It means that everything they learned here up until now, just like an exam, all those who passed this test, those remnants moved on to the next stage. God in the wilderness of Sinai, he taught the commandments, the law, the pattern of the temple, and he taught how to worship God, how to serve God. And in this wilderness, in order for the Israelites to become uh, the chosen people, God trained them. And for a year, almost a year, God had them stay here and had them turn into the form of the image of the covenanted people. But what happened before this? First, prior to the census, 3,000 were killed due to idolatry. What was this? incident of idolatry that 3,000 failed this test. They made an idol of the golden calf because Moses delayed. Moses ascended the Mount Sinai. He went up from the first through the fifth ascent. He went up and he, went, he came down on the same day. However, during the sixth ascent, Moses stayed on top of the mountain for 40 days. They waited and waited, the people waited, but Moses didn't come, and they became anxious. They didn't wait for him, but they wanted something else, another God that they can rely on instead of Moses, and that was the golden calf. And they served that idol. And in their hearts, they had this doubt for Moses. They did not believe in Moses. And if you look, here it says, now when they saw that um, Moses delayed, they wanted, they told Aaron to make us a God who will go before us. For Moses, we do not know what has become of him. They did not have the assurance that Moses was going to come back. So they made this golden calf and served the calf. In Exodus 32, 6, it says they not only just gave worship to the golden calf, they rose up, they and played. And this word to play is sakak, and it means to mock, caress, make sport. And it signifies a very promiscuous, obscene act. And also it says that they got out of control. And this in Hebrew is para, and it means to be naked. They all took off their clothes and they worshipped this idol very uh, sexually, and they had this party. So what happened because of this? 3,000 were killed in a single day by the swords of the sons of Levi. The sons of Levi stood on God's side. And even if they were their brothers, friends, relatives, all those who commit idolatry, the sons of Levi killed them. This, we can see how much God hates idolatry. And God blessed these sons of Levi for listening to his word. What is the first commandment? You shall not have other gods. And idolatry is a great, great sin. How, what happened? How did the Israelites become this uh, fallen to the point of death? So the root cause of death was forgetting the covenant. The root cause of death was forgetting the covenant. God made the Sinaitic covenant with the people of Israel. And this covenant was to officially seal these people as his people. I am your God, you are my people. Therefore, you are mine, and I will take care of you. So these covenanted people were able to receive the land as the inheritance, the promised land. And before the covenant, they received the word, and they all made a vow 
to obey God's words. And during the time the covenant was ratified, they made this vow saying, we will be obedient to all of this uh, word that you have spoken. And they made a sacrifice and sprinkled the blood and they made this covenant. But these people so quickly forgot about the covenant. When you forget God's covenant, it leads to the corruption of faith. When did this covenant, when was it ratified? On the seventh day of the third month, they ratified the covenant. And on the eighth day, the next day, Moses went up for the sixth ascent. And for 40 days, he did not eat, he did not drink, and he received God's word. And while he was coming down, he saw the people of Israel serving idols. They forgot the covenant so quickly. And that means that they took it very lightly. Let's say there is a couple. They love each other so much, and they make this vow to... uh, They get married and they make a vow to love each other until death. And they proclaim that they are a married couple now. But what if one of them, in a few days, they were dating someone else? If you forget the covenant, you cannot keep your heart. It's so easy for sin to enter. That time when Moses was not there, Satan was looking for that time. And it's the same for you and I today. How can we keep ourselves by the covenant? And one of the things that God has given us as a privilege is worship. In Psalm chapter 50, verse 5, it says, We are saints who have made a covenant with God through worship. So every worship service, we're able to remember God's covenant and we're able to make it stronger. And through that covenant, even if there are temptations or tribulations, we gain strength to overcome them. Please believe this. Now we will take a look at the background of the second census at the end of the wilderness journey. This is main point number three. This is in Numbers chapter 26. And if you look at the date and location, it was at the plains of Moab before entering Canaan in 1407 B.C. The plains of Moab was the final place where they camped in the wilderness. Their destination, Canaan, is right before their eyes, and all they have to do is enter. But what's the problem? That's when it's easy to... It's easy to become careless. But that's not the case. What happened to them? In Numbers 26, verse 1, it says that the census took place after the plague. Then in Numbers chapter 25, what happened that this plague, this curse came about and people died? Prior to the census, 24,000 were killed for committing immoral acts. The Israelites committed the sin of sexual immorality with the women of Moab. The Israelites, for 40 years, they only ate the manna, right? But before them, now they had all this delicious food that was given to idols, and they all fell for that. And also these Moabite women who were wearing fancy clothing, they were tempting them, and they all fell for it. And how did this happen? What was behind this was the Council of Balaam. In order to destroy the covenanted community, um, and this is exposed in Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, it says, before the Israelites, he put a stumbling block before them to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. These two things always go together. Idolatry, and sexual immorality. This hindering of Satan 
was, did not just happen back then, but also during the time of the first churches, and even now, until the end times, it happens continuously. We must know that Satan is always planning with these wicked counsels. In Revelation, during the time that this book was written, there were still people who were holding on to the teaching of Balaam. And because of this sin, 24,000 died in a plague. These days, there are people who die from the COVID-19, but it's not comparable to an event where 24,000 die in, an, in the same incident. And this shows how God, how much he hates, how much he hates sexual immorality. And while all these people were dying from the plague, something else happened, and that is, the leader of the tribe of Simeon, Zimri, he took a, me a median wife, a woman, and went into the tent and committed sexual immorality. Seeing all these people die from sexual immorality, he, he, he could not control himself from the sin. And we can see the result of such sexual immorality through the numbers. If you look at the tribe of Simeon, during the, the, the first census, this tribe consisted of 59,300 people, which is a lot. But during the second census, it dropped to 22,200. The tribe dropped to, to less than half of what it used to be. And so in the end, out of all the 12 tribes, the tribe of Simeon became the smallest one. And this shows what happens to the people who actively partake in sexual immorality. And through this, they came all the way here until the end. But we must look at why or how, um, why they partook in this sin. And that was because they did not hold on to God's word. They did not hold on to God's word. After the first census and until the second census, there was a period of 38 years. And it was enough time for them to gird themselves with the covenant and the word. However, they did not hold on to God's word. All of us too, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, even 40 years we've been living our lives of faith. How much of the word have you received? However, the covenanted people, God wants them to only hold on to God's word. Hold on only to God's word. In Deuteronomy 30, 20, it says, by holding fast to him, by obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. And this word to hold fast in Hebrew is dabak. And it means to cling, to stick strongly. So he's saying stick closely to the word. Cling and be attached to the word. All of your life must be a life of obedience to the word. And if you dabak to the word, then you may live in the land which the Lord swore to you. But the Israelites did not hold on to God's word, but they joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And this word to join in Hebrew is tzamad, and it means to be joined strongly. They were joined strongly to the point that they were completely fastened to it. The Israelites were completely fixed. Their thoughts were fixed to this Baal, the idol, and they did not turn back from this. And that is what this word means, tamad. The land of Canaan was right before their eyes, but right before that, how unfortunate is that that they became the food for Satan. God allowed the manna for 40 years. God provided the manna as the way to live. Eat the manna and satis be satisfied with it. 
But if you're not, then you have no choice but to fall to the false gospel, to the false God. And this hindering of Satan is still tempting us today. But if we say, oh, the word of redemptive history, we ate it every day. I'm tired of it. If you say this, then you're no different from the Israelites. We must consider the word of redemptive history as our way to live. It is life, and those who cling on to this word are able to overcome all temptations and trials. We have taken a look at the first and second censuses of the soldiers. Now I would like to summarize them. During the first census, 603,550. And the second census was 601,730. Now, in between these two censuses, 38 years passed. Then, of course, the population should increase. But rather, 1,820 people decreased. And what's even more shocking is that those who were in the first census did not make it to the second census, and they all dropped out. They fell out, except for two people, Joshua and Caleb. Only Joshua and Caleb were in both first and second censuses, and all the first generation died. The first generation are the ones who directly received God's word of the covenant. But even though they were promised this inheritance, if they do not hold on to the word until the end, it shows us that they cannot enter Canaan. And if you look at when the census took place, we see that there were temptations and trials by Satan. And we saw the idolatry and also the sexual immorality. And we saw how they, are, they always go hand in hand. And the numbering, the census took place after these people died. And what does this tell us? That God, only those... God purifies the people morally and in their faith before numbering them. And so only those, uh, the remnants who are pure can enter Canaan and enter and be numbered. So only those who are pure, God sees them as such precious people and acknowledges them through the numbers. So only those who are physically and spiritually pure can enter Canaan. Then this harlot tree that happened in the past, why is it so important? Because it's, it does not end with the history, with the past. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, it tells us that this was recorded for our instruction. This is the word given to us today to us for our instruction God is warning us of this harlotry harlotry is not only something visible if you look in James chapter 4 verse 4 it talks about harlotry as being friends with the world being close to the world and that God calls harlotry but you and I may we not uh, uh, consider the things of the world as priority, but when we are God-centered, please believe that we have the faith to overcome these temptations. So in the end times, let's take a look at the 144,000 who stand on Mount Zion, those who overcame. And the Bible tells us that these people are the ones who have not been defiled with women, and they have kept themselves chaste. Those who remain until the end are the ones who are pure. Their spirit, their soul, all of their thoughts are not defiled by the world, but they only go after God's word. Then in the end times, there is going to be a test. There is going to be uh, Satan trying to block our way. So now I will make our conclusion. In conclusion, the key to survival, the key to staying until the end is to follow God fully. 
그에게 말씀하고 있습니다. Following God fully. 어떤 자에게 생존이라고 하는 영예로운 칭호가 Who is able to survive? In Deuteronomy 4 verse 4 it says You who held fast to the Lord your God. And this is the word dabak that we took a look at. Those who are completely clinging on to God's word are able to become remnants. Then you and I, we can say this. I used to be a district leader and I used to be really diligent. I'll tell you all about my past. But what God sees is not what we did in the past. But today, am I clinging on to God's word today? That's what we must examine. It says here, today, you who are alive today, am I following the word today? We must examine ourselves. And okay, we are following God's word. I give worship, I listen to the word, I pray, I volunteer. And even if we do so, how much of it do we have to do? We see this word fully, fully. Those who were included in the first and second census and entered into Canaan alive, they were Joshua and Caleb. So Numbers 32.12 says Joshua and Caleb, what did they do? They are telling us this key to survival. And it says they followed the Lord fully. Even if we give worship and if we pray and we listen to the word, If, if we're just, um, if we're not doing it fully, that's not right. We have to give all of our heart and with the heart that this is the only way to live. If we're not like that, we cannot reach the level of fullness that God wants from us. But we can be thankful that we have this model for us, that they were able to do so. Every time founding pastor Uh, told us parables, he said, the one who feels most bitter after an exam is the one who got a 99%. If it's not 100%, you're not acknowledged. 100%, then you pass. But 99%, you, you tried, but then it was not to the point of fullness. These days on TV, I see a lot of TV programs, audition programs. And there's a stage, and the participants drop out in every stage. And the one who stays until the end becomes the winner. And this is the same in redemptive history. We must remain until the end. We must not fall out in the middle. God tells us, if only you hold on to this word of the covenant, then you can become that remnant. All of you who are participating in the summer conference right now, I believe that this is God numbering us and saying, you have passed. You are part of the number. What is the theme today of the summer conference? It is the faith that endures to the end and overcomes. We need this today. May you and I hold on to the word of the covenant so that the wilderness does not become our grave, but may we survive until the end and enter Canaan. In doing so, may we become the final victors of redemptive history. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much. You have led us and guided us. You have loved us and made us your covenanted people. And for that, we give all thanks to you. But until the end, we must not think that this is enough. I'm doing enough. But may we remember that we have to go until the end. Father, may we not be proud. And may we, with a humble heart, only cling on to your word. In doing so, may God's word become life for me, strength for me, and may we be able to overcome all temptations. May it be power for us so that even if there are tribulations, we're able to pass all of that and become overcomers. 
May we raise others up with hope so that all of us may enter Canaan. May all the saints of the word become such saints. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you so much.